And welcome in on this cold open here on a Wednesday morning. Big O is in the uh, Indianapolis Combine. His show will start immediately after ours does. This is RedRecover.com Inside the Paint. I'm Ira Winderman from the South Florida Sun Sentinel here in South Florida. He's Kurt Healand from NBC Sports, ProBasketballTalk.com out in L.A. Interesting week for the Heat. Kurt, I'm not sure you've seen many teams in the NBA capable of losing to the Charlotte Hornets and defeating the Philadelphia 76ers in a two-day span. So I'm going to start with this. By the way, I'm on the chat board. Big O already has it set up, so please, whatever you want, smash the like button, join us here. We'll get to every question we can before this hour is up. Kurt Heelan, when you take the long view, what's your perspective on what the Miami Heat are after this sort of ridiculous return from the All-Star break, blown out by the mostly giannis list Milwaukee Bucks, losing to a team that wants nothing more to do than losing, and then stepping forward, sort of got escaping to a degree Philadelphia on Monday night at Wells Fargo Center. What's your perspective on where the Heat stand right now? They're just – the inconsistency is frustrating because the team we saw against – Philadelphia was the one where you're like, hey, that's the team nobody wants to see in the playoffs. That's the team that could make a run. You you start to see, you know, Jimmy's having a great game. Bam's making plays, but other guys are stepping up. Tyler's got some shots, knocking, you know, knocking some shots at it. Just, but the the lack of effort, the loss to a, a Charlotte team that that's the ones you can't afford. Those are the games you get away. That those are the games that make you a play-in team. And not a top, you know, and a top six team, which now they've got to kind of fight to get yeah. those. If, if they end up in the play and even as the seven seed where they can win one and be through. These are the games they're going to look back at. Right, Ira? I mean, they're just going to look back at these and shake their head. You know, there's so much to unwrap because of how the week played out. And certainly tonight's home game against the 76ers will give a further read because can the heat back it up? Can they sustain yeah. something? Can they make the most of this home stretch? Eight of the next nine here at Miami Dade Arena. So I'm sort of going to go backwards here for a second and set up the rest of the show by sort of filling people in on where the Heat stand. The Heat this morning woke up, sort of when they went to bed, number seven in the Eastern Conference, even with the Nets losing last night. If you're number seven, you go to the play-in. Basically, seeds one through six go to the best of seven, first round of the playoffs. They're in. They get a week off after the April 9th regular season finales. Then either the Tuesday or Wednesday of that week, teams seven and eight play. The winner advancing is the number seven seed. Teams nine and ten play. The loser of the seven eight game plays the winner of the nine ten game. So where we stand right now, the Heat are in seventh place. They're a game behind the Brooklyn Nets. What was interesting, and I just checked this overnight, five thirty eight, which runs this uh, daily update on where teams are projected to finish. They have two different models. Both of them align. They have the Heat finishing sixth. The thought the Nets are going to taper off. Really important to note here is. Not only are the Heat still a game and a half behind the Nets, but the Nets have won the season series already. It's a three-game season series. The Nets have won the first two games. So the Heat have to finish ahead of the Nets to get a seat ahead of the Nets. The team that I think we all thought the Heat might have a chance to pass for a nice 4-5 series against Cleveland is changing a little bit. So I want to get your perspective right now. And again, Kurt, you're out in L.A. No one's going to come knock on your door, especially at 6 a.m. So I don't think it's a problem anyway. <laughs> The New York Knicks aren't going anywhere, or are they going to revert to being the New York Knicks? The Knicks right now are number five in the East. The Heat are two and a half games behind. Kurt Heelan, where do you see the Knicks? Is this finally for real or just another Knicks tease? Uh, no, I think they're for real in the sense that they hold the five seed because I it's, it look Miami catching them is unlikely like at this point there's just a lot well, of ground gonna, to make up i'm gonna interrupt you here except for the fact that he'd have three games left against the knicks two is ah. miami Dade arena so again they have to be perfect there is zero margin of error right there they might get the tiebreaker against the knicks tied to two two only because if the heat win a division which to compete for number five or six they'd have to win the division and finish ahead of atlanta that would be the next tiebreaker so there is a chance what this season kurt healing since you cover the NBA from a national perspective, why do you, and I would almost bet for the first time, why do you believe in the New York Knicks maybe more than you might have in recent seasons? Or I don't want to put words in your mouth, or maybe no. why not? I believe in them in this sense, by the way. I think Tom Thibodeau teams 
but they just play hard in the regular season every night. And, and Miami does this when they're playing well, but that matters. Sometimes you just, they win games and they get to the postseason, and everybody else says, all right, we're going to play hard too. And puts it in another gear and the Knicks teams stumble a little and, and Thibodeau teams stumble a little because they, they don't necessarily have that extra gear to go to. But what I think is different this year just starts with their big offseason acquisition. Having Jalen Brunson there settles them. It just gives, even if he's not the guy every night, they're having a true professional point guard to get them into their sets, to get Julius Randle the ball. He's back to being an all-star to set guys up to get, you know, hey, oh, hey, RJ Barrett's got it going tonight. Let's get him the ball. And rather than have him be the playmaker, that just makes them a a competent team night in and night out. I don't think they're a playoff threat, really, but okay. they're a competent team night in and night out, and it's going to be just hard to catch them. Well, so I guess my question to you is, because we're doing this from a Heat perspective, is do you see the Knicks as a team that will emerge with a top six playoff seed? Yeah. Yes, I do. I don't. Okay. I th- I, I'm kind of. I still think 538's kind of got it right, which is the the Nets are fading fast. And I, um, and I think the and, Nets are the team they have to catch. The Heat have one game left at this stretch of eight of nine at home against Brooklyn. That's going to be a key game Saturday night game before the Heat finish with five of their last seven on the road. So that could sort of shake things up. The way the standings are right now, the Knicks are five would play Cleveland in the first round. The Nets are six would play Philadelphia in the first round. The Heat are seven play in it does two things not only do you have to work to make the playoffs but someone like eric spolster who's maniacal at playoff planning loses up to a full week there is a scenario depending how the nba decides how sexy tv matchups are or not the heat could play in a play-in game on friday night and then open the playoffs on the road on a sunday afternoon so you're talking almost no prep you're literally talking from going what likely will be a home game a practice at home Saturday, on the plane, no shoot around Sunday, having to face a team there. To me, the biggest threat of the plane is all this, and I see we're already coming in with plenty of comments on the chat board. I will get to them, is this. If you finish seven or eight, those are the two seats determined by the play-in. Kurt, I think you would agree right now that it looks like in some order, Milwaukee or Boston are going to finish one, two in the East, correct? Yes, definitely. Milwaukee's fantastic without Giannis, so it sort of tells you how good they'll be when he's fully healthy and back in there. They're on their winning streak. They're playing great. The Celtics are just built for this moment. What we learned this season, it's not as much about the coaching and Ime Udoka as it is about simply Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum and their offseason acquisition, Malcolm Brogdon, and what they did to upgrade the roster. They're really good, which is another reason you want six, not only to avoid the play-in, But I think at least Monday showed, Kurt, maybe you'd agree or disagree, that the Heat would have at least a puncher's chance against the Sixers. Oh, I would agree. I I still – I've said it here. I've written it. I think Boston and Milwaukee are not just the two best teams in the East. They're the two best teams in the NBA. But I think you've got against Philadelphia with Bam, with some of the – with Jimmy Butler being Jimmy Butler. Like you said, a puncher's chance. Philly's good. But – I don't know that you can get past the top two. And I, and the thing about Philly is, and you know this because you've covered them with the Clippers and out there in L.A., fill people in out there who aren't as familiar. Doc Rivers' playoff yes. coach. Save for the one year he won the championship with Boston's big three. A little bit shaky, isn't it, Kurt? Yeah, he's he's blown a bunch of big leads. He's blown, a mo- I want to say, three three-in-one leads off the yes. top of my head. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, they've also got James Harden, who is – no, that was point. That was point one A. I was going to say Doc yeah. Rivers is one. James Harden is one yeah. A. We saw a little bit of that when Harden missed the shot at the end of the game on Monday. Yeah. But playoff Harden is a completely different team. Yes, but you're player. right about Doc. Doc. Doc gets stuck in. He's got his guys. He likes. He's got the things he think will work. And when those don't work, a good coach, Eric Spolstra, that's not working. I got to tweak this. I got to adjust this. Doc is slow to do that. If he thinks something will work, he's going to pound it into the ground before he decides he's got to change it. And that opens the door sometimes to comebacks. And and we saw that right now when you see, even when you're looking at Philadelphia right now uh, and last year's playoff series against the Heat, the last memory of playoffs for the Heat, 
was when he stuck with DeAndre Jordan too long, when Joel Embiid yeah. was out. And everyone's like, what the hell are you doing? No, 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 this is going to go. I'm not going to play basketball, Paul. I'm not going to go to a different direction. And that yeah. put them in that hole against the Heat and got them in trouble in the first place. So you have that. And the third factor with the Sixers is Joel Embiid's availability. I mean, yeah. he is a swing vote, and this is a guy who misses playoff time. This is a guy who missed playoff games last season, the first two, with the facial fracture against the Heat. You know, again, it was a happenstance against Toronto in the first round, just happened to be just before they faced the Heat in the second round, but you have that. So going by how the plan works, and for those who don't know, I just posted at sunsetville.com my daily story with the rundown, and here's how the play the plan works. Did that mostly just to tick off the Heat, but figured, what the hell? So the number seven team plays the number eight team. Right now, that seeding would be Heat versus Atlanta Hawks. What makes that a little bit juicier right now is the Quinn Snyder hiring, figuring he will evolve with his players. We saw Atlanta with a, I would say, bad loss last night to the Washington yes. Wizards, especially with Porzingis out for the Wizards. But again, in a one-game series, one game, that series, one-game game, seven versus eight, and a Trey Young on the other side, Kurt, I think you would at least agree that could be a little harrowing, even oh. if in Miami. It's what we love about the NCAA tournament, right? It's, yes, one and done. Hey, yeah, exactly. It's one game. And if some directional school from Maine gets hot from, you know, like has the hot, and Atlanta has the exactly what you said, not only DeJounte Murray, by the way, who can have a great game too, but Trey Young is the guy who can just have one of those nights where he's electric and there's nothing you can do no matter how you guard him unless you throw two guys at him. And Quinn's a smart enough coach to put other guys in position and make plays. Now, of course, your hope is Trey Young goes Trey Young and goes, hey, goes full, basically full Kobe. I could pass or I could shoot it over these three guys. Yeah, right. I'll take the shot. Like, yeah. I'll take the and, shot. And, anyway. and sometimes they'll go in. Last night he had a chance to win the game. Instead of dribbling closer, he took the 30-foot three-pointer in his first attempt. Yeah. He missed it. They got a rebound. He got a second attempt. They missed it. They lost the game. But he's still the threat out there. What's interesting here, Kurt, is this. And again, I'm, I'm doing glass half full and glass half empty. The Heat are two games up on the Hawks. They've split their first two games of the season series. After the Heat played the Sixers tonight and the Knicks on Friday – they have two consecutive home games against the Hawks on Saturday and Monday, which means if the Heat lose those two, the Heat could be on the road for the 7-8 game. They could beat Atlanta at State Farm Arena. That's a game changer also. That gets you in trouble. Yeah. So, again, just to give people the scenarios, if the Heat win the 7-8 game, the game, they finish the number seven seed. That plays the number two seed. Kurt, between Milwaukee and Boston, and it's going to be close and down to the wire without yeah. question, who do you think emerges one and two in the East right now? I've been saying Boston all year, but I mean, Milwaukee's now at 15 straight and just playing out of their minds. They add, they add Jay Crowder. I with you, I kind of think it's a coin flip. They have really, they've hit their stride in Milwaukee. I mean, really. And it's the thing is it's not just Giannis. I mean, they've won, as you noted, a couple of games now in this stretch without him. Uh, Drew holiday is playing spectacular basketball so yes. I, all that said i still think boston's the deeper better team but i think part of that might be that they're just the deeper better playoff team that their versatility and the the two wings make them a much tougher postseason matchup but in the regular mm -hmm. season where you don't get any prep time you don't really get a chance to change what you do night to night Giannis is a problem like you just you can't adapt to it where over the course of seven games you get better at building walls and the things you have to do against him and, and let me ask you this then. Okay, you know you know who you think the top two teams will be if you're the Miami Heat. And again, this is not like the old G-League draft where you pick your playoff opponents and the top seeds will get the choice yeah. anyway. You should do that, though. Puncher's chance, long shot, maybe not win more than one game. Who would you prefer to play if you were the Miami Heat? If you get number seven, who would you rather see at number two in the first round to play you, Boston or Milwaukee? I, I still think it's the Bucks because you've got Bam who can give Giannis – as much trouble as anyone gives Giannis. And I just think that they're not as deep, not as versatile, a little more prone to fluky three-point shooting luck than Boston. Okay. Boston, Boston's so deep, they can just, hey, Derek White's off tonight. We can roll through six other guys because they're just loaded. And they could play that big game with Robert Williams. They're sort of saving a degree with the playoffs. They save Al Horford to a degree. They could be yeah. a, a different team, more of a half-court team, so I got that. 
Okay, we're just putting scenarios out there, folks. We're not saying what's going to happen, what's not going to happen. But yeah. for argument's sake, let's say that he played the 7-8 game. Let's say Trey goes off for 53 and Spo goes, he's going to make 30-foot shots. He's going to make 30-foot shots. Right now, the standings would have the 9-10 game of Washington against Toronto, Toronto at home. If you had to do your Kurt Heel in advance NBA two months from now picks, who do you think might emerge from a Washington at Toronto game? And I'm curious about this because I Ooh. think I might disagree. Yeah, I've been so high on Toronto all season, but in one game, assuming Porzingis is healthy, that might be Washington. They just with Bradley Beal I've, and and Porzingis, I just feel like they've got guys and Kuzma, frankly. They've got guys who can have the one big game yes. under pressure. Kuzma has played one played big games under pressure. Uh, I, now, granted, Siakam's got a ring. There's guys on that team that can play in Toronto. But I feel like the ceiling – is it just me, Ira, that the ceiling's higher with Washington? I think the one-game ceiling is higher yeah, with Washington. That's what I, mean. yeah. I think to win one game, it is with Washington. But like you said, to me – and this is a real concern with the Heat. In a one-game series, in a one-game scenario, let me say, you need the player who can go off and lift the team. We know the Hawks have that in Trey Young. We know the Wizards can have that in either Bradley Beal, like you mentioned, in Porzingis to a lesser degree, but certainly in Kuzma, who's done it against the Heat this year. For Toronto, yes, Siakam can, but doesn't often. Fred Van Vliet can, but doesn't as much as, say, a Bradley Beal. So let's say the Heat lose the 7-8 game, e either home or road to the, to the Atlanta Hawks, and now they're playing for the number eight seed. Miami Heat at home. It, I, I can't see a scenario where the Heat won't be home in that game. Yeah. Heat at home against the Toronto Raptors. I still like the Heat in that series game. I, I they have just not been able to put it together in Toronto, despite what I thought they were a better regular season team than a playoff team anyway, and they just really haven't put it together. Um, I don't. I think you can slow Siakam and their offense. Really, they get bogged down if they're in the half court. Their half court offense is yes. the Heat. They're when they're dangerous is when you turn the ball over 20 times, you're in trouble because they're just going to get out and run and go crazy. But their half court isn't that great. And, and again, since I'm a little more familiar, the one thing I will tell you is every time the Heat play the Raptors, it goes down to the last shot. It goes to overtime. It is a slog. The game is going to be 193-91, something like that. The Wizards have shown that Kuzma can get hot. It can beat the Heat. Matter of fact, they might have more single game players. I like to refer to them than the yeah. Heat. Anyway. The whole point, folks, out here is not to scare you away, but just to make you realize this. The Heat need to avoid the play-in. The play-in can be so random, especially with the play-in players in the East. I don't think it's the same in the West, by the way, unless the Warriors wind up down there or maybe LeBron and the Lakers wind up down there. But I think the East is fraught with roadblocks, with, with landmines, shall we say, if you get to the play-in. I think if the Heat can get to the playoffs, get the number three seed, probably play Philadelphia, I think you could see the Heat competing through the end of April. Get to the play-in, no such guarantees. Anyway, I wanted to set up that scenario. We're getting a lot of really good feedback here on the chat board. So we're going to go to break on RedRecover.com Inside the Paint. When we come back, Kurt Heelan and I will go to your questions and your thoughts. So load us up on the chat board, smash the like button, and we'll be right back after this break on RedRecover.com inside the paint and hey, welcome listen. back to our typical usual wednesday 9 a.m redrecover.com inside the paint show i'm ira winderman from the south florida sun sentinel here in fort lauderdale he's kurt healan from pro basketball talk nbcsports.com out in the los angeles area if you missed our first segment we were talking about the heat the play-in what might happen what might not happen fascinating radio you can catch that on any podcast outlet for the big o show Big O will be back at the top of the hour from the Combine in Indianapolis. He will give you a player-by-player -player rundown on all of the first 32 picks in the NFL draft, so you want to stay tuned for that. If not, you can email Kurt. He'll give you his thoughts as well, or at least on his uh, L.A. teams out there. But we'll stick to <laughs> basketball in this segment. We're going to go to the chat board, which means the reading glasses, because all of a sudden I got so much, I got to go to the tiny print here. So, Kurt, I'm going to throw some of these out there, sort of get your thoughts right here on some of the thoughts from our listeners to extreme or regular here says, did anybody notice how quickly Bam crumbled when he's up against an actual player like Joel Embiid? I'm going to take this a different direction because this is something Kurt, I answered to my ask Ira mailbag this morning at sunsentinel.com. Bam has struggled against Nikola Jokic, 
before the uh, All-Star break. Struggled to a degree against Brooke Lopez after the All-Star break. You could see his offense wasn't there. He had to work so much defensively against Joel Embiid on Monday night. From a distance, Kurt, do the Heat need to get to a point where they consider Bam as more of a power forward? In other words, each of the three guys I just mentioned to you, Jokic, Brooke Lopez, and Joel Embiid, are three of the biggest big bodies in the NBA. You don't get that ma- those matchups a lot anymore, but you do at times. Are the Heat asking too much of Bam Adebayo to give up 20, 30, 40 pounds, two, three, four inches, and do this 82 times a season? Well, the thing is, he doesn't have to do it 82 times a season. Like you said, they don't do it very often. But most teams have a big body at the end of the bench just for this or just for a theoretical playoff scenario because it's going to wear on him, right? Like you need somebody out there to soak up 15 minutes of Joel Embiid, even if Joel's, look, he's he's an MVP level player. He's going to score on Joel, on Bam. He's going to score on whoever you roll out there. But if somebody can take the physical pounding for a little bit and, and ease things for Bam, it helps. You can't ask Bam to play 40 against Joel Embiid or 36 or whatever. It's just, I don't think that's a reasonable ask, is it? No, it isn't. And something fascinating has happened in the NBA since the trade and buyout deadline. I didn't see this coming. One is out here in the East. One is out there in the West for you. I thought the age of the Zellers and the Plumleys (laughs) was over. I thought the hulking big man, we've spoken about this on redrecover.com inside the paint for, you know, ad nauseum, how it's a different league right now. You need the agile center. Kurt, does it surprise you how Cody Zeller here has really helped the Heat? Yeah. And even for the Clippers, and we saw some of this, you know, last night on national television and Plumlee, what he's done for the Clippers. Is there actually a place for a lumbering big man in the NBA? Cody Zeller chased down block on Embiid. Of course, there's <laughs> uh, that was. I think there is though. I think just for the reason you said that there are certain teams who, if you're going to be a seven foot plus lump, you know, big big man, tr- a more traditional big man, and there aren't many of them in the league anymore, you still need somebody to counter that. There's the guys who play regularly, the Embiid's, the Jokic's, whatever, like, like Brook Lopez. They're gifted players. They can step out. They can do all this other stuff. Uh, you know, Jokic and his passing. But you still need a body out there. Plumlee really – It's. I was at that game last night. Ty Lue was throwing everything against the wall just to see yes. what sticks because it's they're a brand-new team still. But I think my favorite part of that game was Plumlee drew a foul on um, Rudy Gobert with a pump fake. And I'm up on media roll. We cracked up and like Lawrence Frank, the GM's about four seats down from us. We're like looking at him like you got him for the pump fake, right? Like you, you brought in, it was hysterical. Um, but those guys, yeah, I think that there's a role for those guys in a limited spot and they kind of know it. They kind of know they're mercenaries now that they're going to bounce around, but there's a spot for them if they're a competent big body. You know what? And I'll say this because you and I have spoken ad nauseum on redrecover.com about players taking load management. Certainly the Clippers, a prime example of that. We've spoken about the players who play only sometimes, which is why the Heat have had some of these horrible losses. The one thing about Cody Zeller and Plumlee that they have together is they work. They're there. They'll throw their body out there. They'll do the dirty work. Cody with a year away from the game after that leg injury in Portland comes back playing as hard as he can, doesn't care about fouls, doesn't care about minutes. He's throwing it all out there. And I just think that sometimes that's what you need during the regular season in the NBA is just a guy willing to work. So I find that interesting. Um, Two Extreme then comes back and talks about how the Heat, you don't know who they are. Chris uh, C. Dollar says, hey, the Heat beat Joel Embiid last year in the seven-game series. Uh, Two Extreme comes back and said, yeah, Joel Embiid missed two games with a broken face. Let me ask you this, Kurt Heelan. We talked in our first segment about the Heat want to get to six, likely a series against the Sixers. They're up 1-0 right now in the best of three regular season series played tonight at Miami Dade Arena. Is there a roadmap when you're doing your playoff previews at Pro Basketball Talk and you're doing Heat versus 76ers and you're making your predictions and you're doing your why the Sixers can win, why the Heat can win? What would your roadmap of a Heat playoff win against the 76ers entail 
peak Jimmy Butler for all, let's say, six, seven games. I, I imagine this series goes a while. Uh, you're going to need really good Jimmy Butler through all of it. You're going to need some hot Tyler Hero nights or somebody else. You know, somebody, somebody. I'm going to say Tyler because he's the most likely candidate. Maybe it's Gabe. Maybe it's somebody. Somebody's got to light you up for a night and get you 35 and, and have hit 10 threes. And then you've got, I think, you're going to need a little help. Joel Embiid is an MVP candidate. You need him, if he doesn't miss time, to have an off night. You need James Harden to be James Harden. You need Doc Rivers to get stuck in one of his loops. Um, right. You're going to need a little help, but it, there is a map. There is, a, I think, a more reasonable path than against the Bucks or Celtics to get through because I just think they were a more flawed team, especially in the playoffs. Especially yeah, no, I agree. I mean, you, I get the, you get to the second it, it, game it, it, against – you get to set game seven against James Harden or game six, he could melt. Yes. Or against Doc Rivers, or you throw the zone out there and you wind up just being a little different. Yeah. I think you'd agree that you, Eric Spolster could out coach Doc Rivers in a oh, yeah. one game winner take all game. We sort of saw that in game six last year against Philadelphia. See, Dollar chimes in. I'm not going to use the nickname that Big O uses for Kyle Lowry. I'll leave that to others. But he says, I hate to say it, Big O, but we need Kyle. I think that he'd do. I, I think what we've seen from Gabe Vincent, he had a good game Monday against Philadelphia, but he sort of is what he is. The Heat also don't have a lot of depth at point guard and playmakers. I'm going to throw one at you right now. I know you haven't seen that much of him, but he's been around there. The Chicago Bulls, because they added Patrick Beverly, decided to wave and set free Gore on Dragic so he can yeah. get minutes somewhere. I, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot here. I do this with scouts sometimes, and they're very honest, and they just tell me I haven't seen the player. Do you think Goran has any game left? Not much. Or okay. Not, I mean, not much. Look, that's a team in Chicago without Lonzo Ball, desperate for help with the point guard, and they weren't playing him. That's I have again. I don't think we've I've seen much of him, but that's a really bad sign. I mean, they're going with Cody White, and they're going and getting Pat Beverly. Um, it's a sign that there's not a lot there. That said, I, I think it becomes a question of, and, and I know you wrote about this, like, who are you letting go? Yurt are you are you letting Highsmith go? Like, is that a trade-off you'd be willing to make? Well, and the crazy thing is, and again, I almost feel like I'm doing it mean-spirited because since, thank you, by the way, for clicking, is I also mentioned Udonis Haslam in that list. And it's just a weird situation that you can add insurance at point guard for someone who never plays, but there's no way that Udonis Haslam in season 20 is going out that way. So you can't do that. You have Highwood Highsmith under contract at the minimum for next season. In a year, you're going to be into the tax where value players make a difference. So you can use someone like that. You have Omar Yurtsevin, who's going to go in. You have his bird rights. He's restricted. You can control his market unless you say, hey, the Cody Zeller thing is real. But you can always use depth to the center. So I think the Heat roster is sort of an interesting place where – you might be able to make that move, but you're sort of limited by what you have and thinking about the future. To me, folks, and this is something, and feel free to chime on this, this is where I think the Heat have lost their way this season. You have a 36, 37-year-old point guard in Kyle Lowry. You have a 33-year-old floor leader in Jimmy Butler. And yet it seems there's so many yin-yang moves when the Heat is weighing its future while also living in the moment. And I believe when you have a team, sort of like the Clippers, with Kawhi and Paul George, that's win now. You play to win the game now. You take chances on older players. You live in the moment. Look, Russell Westbrook could be an utter flop. But you're trying to get Kawhi and Paul George to that finish line while they still have something in them. When I look at the Miami Heat, I'm saying, wait a minute. Are you playing for Jimmy and Kyle? Are you playing for Tyler and Bam? Are you playing to save against the tax now to go into the tax later? Are you trying to get cheaper players for the future because you want to – be able to build around those guys. Are you not willing to trade Tyler in the offseason? I think they're caught in between. I think Goran Dragic would be perfect for Jimmy Butler. I think Jimmy Butler, after losing P.J. Tucker, after not seeing a major, any gain, honestly, at the trading deadline when people thought that he could make, make a gain, I just wonder how Jimmy Butler's going to react when they go to, you know, Jimmy, you're right, Goran. And, and again, these guys are friends. He talks about it all the time when they were there. You guys are friends, but uh, we're going to protect Haywood Highsmith instead. We're going to protect Omar Yurtsevin instead. And I can imagine the eye roll. And to me, and I was talking to someone with the Heat about this yesterday, the ultimate FU 
to get Kyle Lowry's attention would be to bring back Goran Dragic and give him back his number seven. Which, of course, because of, as you know, Jersey rules, yeah. <laughs> something like that. But let me ask you this, Kurt. I'm going to take it out to a bigger picture here to get more of your national perspective from Pro Basketball Talk. If I told you I have a team going into the NBA playoffs, possibly to face Boston or Milwaukee or a chance against Philadelphia, and their entire point guard rotation is Kyle Lowry at 36 in his injury history and Gabe Vincent as the only other true point guard on the roster, what would you say about going into the playoffs just with those two? That's not enough depth and versatility. And it's it's just because I don't think you know what you can get from Kyle night to night. You know what you're going to get from Gabe, but like you said, it kind of is what it is. Gabe is who he is. He's he's gotten as much out of what he is going to I, – like I don't want to take anything away from him. He's gotten as much out of it, but he kind of is what he is. Goran would give you the threat of something more. I don't know how much he could bring it, but we were talking earlier. Hey, man. Game five, when you kind of need something, hey, suddenly yes. Goran has one of those games. Yes, you, you 14 find, points, 16 points, something that keeps He jumps in the hot tub time Butler. machine, yeah. Yeah, he, and so he's, Jimmy Butler can take game. a rest. So Jimmy Butler can go to the bench and you have offense, which they don't right now. I've done this season-long screed about Jimmy Butler sitting out in the fourth quarter longer than I think. I know it's a coaching issue. It's not on Jimmy. He would get in there. He's from the Thibodeau school. He would play all the minutes. But the Heat's lack of scoring depth lack of scoring, last in the league in scoring. I think you can see that. Anyway, I got away from the chat board here, which I always seem to do, so I don't want to let this linger because then I can't keep scrolling back. Uh, Two Extreme says um, he was talking about that how Bam is banging his chest like he wants to be defensive player of the year, but he can't challenge players like Joel Embiid. Again, it's offense-defense. You're not voting defensive player of the year based on offense, or Rudy Gobert never would have won it. My question to you, Kurt Heelan, is, can you be a great defensive player, a good offensive player, and still be considered a superstar in the NBA? I don't know about superstar. I, I, I think that Rudy Gobert kind of tapped that market out where he wasn't a terrible offensive player. He's got good hands around the – well, he is this year. But he's got good hands around the rim. He did some stuff in Utah. But that's about the max I think you can do if you're all defense, no offense. I think Bam – at least with his floater game and some of the stuff he's done this year has shown, a, has shown more offensive versatility um, has shown a little depth. I think he is capable of taking another step. Um, and by the way, defensively, nobody stops Joel Embiid. Yes. <laughs> Just, yes. That's why he's yeah, scoring. That's, that's like, why he's been right at the top of the league all season. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah it, so. it's a, that guy is where he is for a reason. Yeah. And again, now here's another one I had on the chat board. And again, this has been mentioned by a few there, C. Dalla, among others. The scenario I just gave you that he's looking to the future and the Bam Tyler era when the Jimmy Kyle era ends. And the thought on the chat board here is, can you win in the NBA with Bam Adebayo as your best player? I think that's fascinating. So, Kurt Heelan, you're seeing in the East, leading men, Jason Tatum is going to be with the Celtics for a while. We assume Joel Embiid will be with the Sixers for a while, although that can get a little janky. We'll talk about that in our last segment here on RedRecover.com, Inside the Paint. Giannis has been nothing but loyal to the yes. Milwaukee Bucks. So if the Heat do foresee a future where Bam Adebayo is their best player, what say you, Kurt Heelan, about their overall outlook taking that type of approach? I, I don't think – I and I love Bam. I think he's a two, not a one. I don't think he is the best player on a championship or, or even deep playoff run team. He doesn't create for himself. Um, you've got Tyler who can do some of that, but I still think you would need either an elite wing or elite guard to be the primary shot creator and score. Bam can play off of that and then bring you defense, but I don't think he's a number one on a championship team. And I want to. I'm going to set up a little teaser segment here because I heard that's what radio people do. And we'll we'll come back with it in some quick <laughs> comments from Kurt Heelan on RedRecover.com inside the paint. People are talking about the future of the Miami Heat. Name that's going to keep coming up. Might even play him in the play around is Bradley Beal. He was very good against Atlanta last night. We keep hearing in Portland about Damian Lillard. I'm not going anywhere. Stop it. I'm going to be Blazer for life. I tend to believe. Damian Lillard is more likely to play his entire career in Portland than Bradley Beal play his entire career Absolutely. in Washington. Agree or disagree, Kurt Heelan? 
Absolutely agree. And I, I know some people closer to Dame. Um, he genuinely, it, he genuinely plans to play this thing out. I, I genuinely, I mean, I don't want to say things never change, but I would be surprised if at this point, if Damian Lillard leaves Portland a year or two ago, I would have thought differently. They're paying him to stay. He loves it there. He wants to go down right. this way. I'm not sure just, just from his public comments, Bradley Beal wavers more about this. He genuinely thinks about the, how much greener the grass will be in a way that Damian just doesn't. And I, and I agree with that. And I, I think Bradley Beal, there have been other faces of the Wizards during Bradley Beal's time there. There's been John Wall there. There was a Westbrook period. They've gone in other directions where, I mean, from the get-go, the Blazers from the moment almost he was drafted, I know C.J. McCollum had a nice run, but the Blazers have been Damian Lillard's team. It's been the Damian Lillard era. I'm not so sure you could say that a Bradley Beal era. And then here's the no. teaser I want to get to, and then we'll go to break real quick. If the 76ers crash and burn, We've already heard Joel Embiid talk about possibly heading somewhere else. Could you see Joel Embiid pulling a Kevin Durant or Kyrie Irving if the 76ers do not, for the first time in his career with the Sixers, make the Eastern Conference Finals? Could you, th could you see Joel Embiid sort of push-pulling and maybe trying to get out of Philly? If he feels management – like if he's, got, if he's struggling with Harden and feels that management there isn't behind him, yeah, actually, I think he's – I think he's the kind of guy who could just get fed up and, and almost like a Kevin Garnett, just like, that's it. I'm out of this. And then my last question on this segment is, and if you were the Miami Heat, would you put Bam Adebayo in a package considering age and injury history for Joel Embiid? To win now, yes. Yeah, Joel's just I'm, su I'm yeah. surprised you're even hemming and hawing, and I'm going to stop you right there because I want to continue this conversation after this break because the Heat do host the 76ers tonight. So I'm going to let you feed the dog, marinate on that, and we'll be back after this break on RedRecover.com, Inside the Paint. And we're back for our final segment of our weekly Wednesday, 9 a.m. Eastern time, RedRecover.com, Inside the Paint. I'm Ira Winderman from the South Florida Sun Sentinel here in Fort Lauderdale. He's Kurt Heelan from Pro Basketball Talk, NBCSports.com. Out in the Los Angeles area, if you missed either of our first two segments here, you can catch them on all podcast outlets on the Big O Show. Big O will be back from the NFL Combine. He'll be rating players 1 through 900 at the top of the hour, so you're going to want to catch that. I want to throw it back to Kurt Heelan. We talked about this at the end of the last segment. I think this is an issue. I think Kurt was downplaying it. Kurt Heelan, if Joel Embiid goes out early in the playoffs again, the only time he really had a chance for a deep playoff run was when Kawhi Leonard hit that corner three-pointer that eliminated, eliminated them against the Toronto Raptors. After he lost last season in the second round against the Heat, he said, we need to get tougher. They brought in P.J. Tucker. He also mentioned possibly joining Jimmy Butler. Those two were close. There was no falling out there. It was other players with Jimmy in Philadelphia. Do you think that Joel Embiid could be that player? In other words, you know the mindset of players. There yeah. were certain players who were unhappy, grouse behind the scenes, never go public. Then there's Kyrie Irving, and there's other players like that. And then there's middle ground players like Kevin Durant, who try to make it seem as in the situation is forcing his hand, but you know behind the scenes he's pushing. Philadelphia 76ers go out in the first or second round this year. You're writing pro basketball talk. You're sitting there all juicy. You're sort of slobbering like your dog there. <laughs> what do you think would happen with Joel Embiid and the off-season chatter if the 76ers don't make it to the Eastern Conference Finals? Uh, there'd be a lot of interest in teams. I think there'd be a lot of teams reaching out and checking because, look, every team, Ira, you know this, the Heat have it, all 30 teams have this. There's a list. Maybe some teams keep it in a drawer. There's a list of, hey, who's the next superstar? Who's the next guy who might be on the move? Bradley Beal's been on that list. There's other guys who sit on uh, Zach Levine's been on that list. Durant has been on the list for years. For, yeah. Yeah. You could perpetually. Um, yeah. They wrote him in Sharpie on the whiteboard. It's they're not wiping it off. Um, Joel Embiid's on that list. That's a guy. A lot of teams are watching, um, especially your old neck of the woods in New York. There are a lot of people up there keeping an Always eye on him. New York, even without Mark Berman at the post. Yes, I agree with yes, that. Exactly. There are a lot of people. So, there's a lot of people watching to see if he just does become unhappy enough to think that, hey, I can't win here. I know that they can win in Miami. 
or, or, you know, maybe, maybe he chooses New York, maybe he does something else, but he decides the grass is greener somewhere else. And again, close to Jimmy. And an, if he's leaving Philly, he's going to go to an organization where he believes the organization can get him there. And certainly the Heat have that track record. So let's say I put together a Heat deal that includes Bam Adebayo and for argument's sake, Tyler Hero. So again, there would be other moving parts there. I see that's yeah. your chagrin. Yet I think most of the people here would agree that if the Heat can make an, an Embiid move, they would have to. Yeah. If you are left just with Jimmy and Joel Embiid, is that enough to build around to compete in the Giannis Jason Tatum Eastern Conference? You're going to need to make some really smart moves around them. You're going to need some depth and versatility. But yes, I think that those are two guys. Here's the challenge, I think, right? With both of them, you're going to get 60 to 65 games in the regular season. You're going to have to find a way to be good enough over that stretch and over the regular season and have guys who can step up so that when you hit the playoffs healthy, you know, you're rolling that everything's clicking and then you're really dangerous. But that's the concern is that those guys are, you know, I know Joel Embiid's playing a little, playing more this year. I should probably knock him, but I think that that ultimately you go into this thinking we've got to target the postseason and we've got to find a way to get regular season wins. But that said, yes, in the postseason, those two guys can can take you a long, long way. And I agree when the game slows. I wanted to get to that as the long-term perspective because I do think, especially with the Heat playing Philly tonight, that can come into play. C. Dalla asked today, he says, today is the buyout deadline. Yes, March 1st is and isn't. People get this confused. A player must be waived by March 1st to be playoff eligible for another team's roster. That's why you saw the Will Barton move recently by the Wizards. That's why you saw the Goran Dragic move yesterday yeah. by the Chicago Bulls. However, if a player is waived by March 1st, he can be signed any time up till the April 9th season finale, the day before or just before your team's final regular season game, to be playoff eligible. So right now, the market is really slow. As a matter of fact, some of the names we thought might be going somewhere, like a Serge Ibaka, remain there out on the market. Other teams have rushed to pull people. Will Barton goes from Washington, boom. He's in Toronto like that. They get that taken care of. The Terrence Rosses, the Danny Greens, the um, Kevin Loves for the Miami Heat, those yeah. guys are taken care of. Kern, are we pretty much done on the buyout market? Or when you're sitting there for a pro basketball talk, are you going to sort of keep refreshing out every now and then seeing until the waiver deadline tonight, do you think there could be others coming free? Or do you think since the trade deadline is so early these days, in February 9th, that now by March 1st is pretty much settled down? I think it's pretty much settled down. I don't know of a – I mean, who's out there that we talked about is, oh, that's a guy who could be really big on the market that didn't we didn't see already. Um, I mean, there have been – Derek Rose is not having this. Con I don't know how much he helps, but no, he's, I mean, he's not playing in New York, but he's, he but he's not yesterday. But he's not waiting to see. Asking. But you know what? Guys also judge situations this way. If I do request a buyout, do I already have a landing spot? I mean, oh, Kurt, yes. it really is curious. As soon as guys get bought out, immediately they're linked to a team. They know that what they're oh, yeah. giving up and what they're getting instead. Russell Westbrook seemingly from the get-go knew he was going from the Clippers. Kevin Love, when he came to that decision – I think on a Friday, by Sunday, he was with the Heat and he had reached his agreement. So he knew where he was going. So the thing with Derrick Rose is, unless maybe it's Chicago and the, and the point guard depth you spoke about, but they got Patrick Beverly already. So they're going in a different direction there. That might be the only thing I can see. We know also that Derrick Rose is so closely tied to Tibbs that if Tibbs is going to have yes. playoff success, I think Derrick Rose would just want to be there for that. And then there's another subset of players. This is where Cody Zeller came from. This is where DeMarcus Cousin lives and even Dwight Howard when he comes back from Taiwan. If you haven't been in the NBA this season or if you've only been on 10-day contracts, you're eligible to be signed anytime. You don't need to be waived by March 1st because you're not on a roster on March 1st. So there are the overseas guys. And we do see this every now and then, end of the yeah. season. A guy we totally forgot about because he was in France or Spain or Italy – or just playing somewhere else overseas, Russia, where he comes back and he joins a team. So that subset is still there. Yes, you still can sign DeMarcus Cousins. You still can sign Dwight Howard. You can sign any player who's been out of the NBA, like Cody Zeller, and might come back. And certainly Cody Zeller shocked the hell out of us for a guy who hasn't played since January 2022, that he still has his legs because some guys care enough. 
So I want to go to this because that leads to another thing here. See, Dollar brings this up. He goes, I was expecting a regular, better regular season. I kind of blame Jimmy and his load management thing when you look back at this all. Kurt Heal and Jimmy Butler has missed 15 games in the 82-game season, which means he's going to finish playing about 68 games, 67 games. Isn't that sort of what you expect these days? In other words, is that the kind of number you look at and you go, how dare you? Or is that the kind of number you look at and you go, eh, that's an NBA star in his 30s, and that's sort of yeah. what I expect? I think it's the latter now. I think as much as we get frustrated with that, and by the way, it's, it's a conversation for another day. That This is team-driven at points with some teams. And I, Jimmy's got his guys, but the Heat have all their people. They track stuff. They're telling him to sit certain nights too because they are trying to save him for the postseason. It's not all on the player. Um, I think that with most stars, especially older stars, it's a little different if you're talking about, I don't know, John Morant or something. Yeah, you're, if, you get, if you get 70, 65 to 70 games for – a guy 29 or older, that's kind of the number now. And it's kind of messes, by the way, with stuff like, I mean, it's been an issue in MVP voting, right? It's been with Embiid not playing as many games as Jokic has been a, a deciding factor. Like, it matters. But if you've got Embiid and you're trying to win in the playoffs, like, hey, if I get 65 games out of him and hit the postseason healthy, that's good. Do you think what they're talking about, and I know the Players Association has even been in talks with the NBA about this, a minimum number of games for NBA postseason mm. awards, which also are tied to a lot of player bonuses. Are you yes. in on that? I'm curious how they handle that. I think it with I think with some awards, and I'll just say this as, as a voter, with MVP, with Defensive Player of the Year, I don't think uh, games played, and I actually use minutes, minutes played matters just because how valuable you are to your team in those roles depends on you actually physically being on the court where I think with some other stuff, it'd be interesting with, I I'm more lenient with all NBA just because I picture that as a snapshot of the theoretically, you know, 15 best players in the league who are the three best centers who are the six best forwards. And I'm a little more forgiving, not like, Hey, you played 30 games forgiving, but a little more forgiving there just because Hey, LeBron didn't play in as many games, but when he did play, it was fantastic, and he kind of deserves that. You know, I, I you're a little more giving there. And we'll I see. like your point about minutes. And John Hollinger even mentioned this, or else a player is going to go on the court for one minute, like Giannis did in the All Star game. Yes, he's an All Star. Twenty seconds later, he's out of the game, so you can finagle that. For example, the Heat's final game of the regular season might be minute meaningless. It's against the Orlando Magic here in Miami. So if a player like Jimmy needed to reach the seventy games threshold if that was in play, which is not this year, yeah, he would just go out on the court and step off. So I agree that your minutes probably mean more than games, even though by playing that kind of game, it brings all your averages down. But I also think there's another factor there. I'm not so sure that a 33-year-old Jimmy Butler gives a rat's ass about being third-team All-NBA versus no. preserving his body for the playoffs. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And he's, yeah, I think there's a lot of players in that mode. So I, I just think that I, I know what they're trying to do to get players play more. I think it's sort of like what the Steve Kerr's of the world say. You can change the schedule however you want. Yeah. But if I see one of my guys is tired and coaches will never see this and I see the team we're playing stinks, I could do it. Or the team we're playing is great and we're not going into Boston or going into Milwaukee yeah. and, or going into Denver at altitude and winning anyway. So I'm going to sit my guy. So there will be those considerations whether the season is 82 or 72 or 62 games. I think it's just where we are now with all these performance coaches trying to get the most out of their players and out of their teams. So we've gone through all the heat possibilities. We've gone to the chat board as much as I can get here. Uh, we know today's the buyout deadline. By next Wednesday's show, sort of most of the rosters will be filled. Want to get to the Heat's upcoming schedule because to me it's fascinating. I'm going to go a little further out than usual. First of all, the Heat, when they played Philadelphia on Monday, had 21 games left in the regular season. The projection there was that the Heat needed to go 14-7 and seven to assure themselves of a play in, play off, not play-in spot. So the point I'm trying to make as I go through the schedule with Kurt Heal and from Pro Basketball Talk right here is splitting series is not enough for the Heat. 500 won't be enough to assure playoff versus play-in. Tonight, Philadelphia 76ers, Miami Dade Arena – formerly FTX Arena, formerly American Airlines Arena. <laughs> Can you see the Heat backing up what they did on Monday, or do you see a Philadelphia team saying, Dan, 
We were within one James Harden three-pointer of winning that game. We sure as hell aren't losing two in a row to this team when we're already coming off an emotional loss against the Celtics. Yeah, I think a little more of the latter. I just think you're going to get a more fired up Sixers team. I think it's tough to win in these regular season games. In the regular season where you're not making the same kind of playoff adjustments, I just think it's tough to win two in a row like that. And I think it's almost must win for the Miami Heat for the reason I mentioned. They can't afford yeah. these no, I think it's They more. need to do something more. And yet I'm not so sure the Heat can get more out of this roster than what they got on Monday. I guess it would mean more Bam, Bam Adebayo offense. It would mean Tyler Hero hitting a better percentage of his shots. But the Heat sort of are who they are. So you have that game tonight. Then we get busy. Friday night against the New York Knicks. We spoke about the New York Knicks in our That's first segment. You can one. catch that on your big old podcast outlets. The Knicks are in it to win it. We know Tom Thibodeau will play a guy 48 minutes if he has to. The Heat have three games left to try against the New York Knicks to try to make up two and a half. So the Heat know how important it is. Do you consider the Knicks significantly better than the Heat, or do you think we're looking more at toss-up no. scenarios? More, more, more toss-up. In fact, I think the Heat single game focused Heat are a better team. Um, they just we haven't. The, the Knicks have been a little more consistent bringing that energy, which is very Tibbs. Um, but I, I, a, I think those are, that's a huge game Friday night. And B, I think that the I, I think it's more of a toss up. I like I think these teams are relatively close. And then it gets tougher. Saturday night against the Atlanta Hawks here. Monday night against the Atlanta Hawks here. Before you and I talk again next Wednesday, that again is the scenario I'm talking to you about, Kurt Heelan. Yeah. You need to win both. Can you win both, or does Trey Young go off on one? Does the Quinn Snyder new coach bump finally hit home? How do you look at those two games? I think you, I think you can win both. Um, I, I'm not sure how much – I mean, is it just me? I just don't think Quinn can make that big a difference 60-plus games into the season. Like, he can't – as much as his system is great and, I, and he can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe because of his contract and status now with Trey Young and say, hey – Start playing some team ball. Stop pounding this thing. We're going to do it. That's all training camp stuff. Everything he wants to install is training camp stuff. Yeah, I'm so surprised a be... coach like that with a pedigree like that took a job in midseason, but I think yes. the money was there. I think to be a coach in waiting would have been a worse scenario for Atlanta, so I agree with you there. The point I'm making is it doesn't get any easier for the Heat. I think a lot of people looking at this stretch and saying eight of nine at home, they can make hay. These are tough, critical, big games, and we'll be monitoring that for you. But – for right now, it's Big O at the NFL Combine in Indianapolis. So we'll catch you again next week. I'm Kurt. I'm, I'm not Kurt Healan. He's Kurt Healan. I'm Ira Winderman. And this <laughs> has been RedRecover.com <laughs> Inside the Paint. And I think I've had enough for today. The Big O Show rolls on. This is the Big O Show. This is the Big O Show.